This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 343, recorded on June 26th, 2015. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in the TWIV studio, Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. How is everything, Dixon? Everything is good. I haven't seen you in a long time. I know, I was here last week. Uh, today is a gorgeous day. <laughs> today is a gorgeous day. 25 Celsius. It just is. a few puffy clouds. It's a Georgia O'Keeffe sky. However, the, the weather says 100% chance of rain. Well. Beginning at, well, I don't know, it doesn't even say beginning. When? No, it can't predict that well. I'm no? sorry. Today, tomorrow, and Sunday, it's supposed to Yeah, rain. Sunday is supposed to get a bucket load of rain. Also joining us today from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hello, Kathy. How are it's you? Great. And the weather here is 73 Fahrenheit, 23 Celsius. Uh, sunrise, 559. Sunset, 915. <laughs> no threats of tornadoes? Not today. Not today. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you have a tornado recently? Uh, tornadoes came through, uh, was it Monday night? Yeah. 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 Big storm. Yeah, in fact, Alan tweeted a picture of, a, of the storm. Really? Right? Yeah. Oh, also joining us from Western yes, Massachusetts. You can't answer. He's not <laughs> Alan Dove. Yet. Good to be here. <laughs> yes. You Good did tweet that picture, here. right? <laughs> yes, yes. I tweeted the. Um, uh, it was a it was a weather satellite uh, false color false color satellite picture that highlights clouds of different mm-hmm. densities and the this big eye of Sauron in the middle of the country, just <laughs> dark red and and looking yeah. really angry. Right, yeah. right about basically over Kathy's house. Mm-hmm. Wow. Also joining us today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Howdy. How are you doing, Rich? How's it going out I, there? Uh, uh, good. I, I'm having a serious uh, weather discrepancy, however, Uh-oh. <laughs> because my little weather bug on my computer says that it's 78 Fahrenheit. I'm not believing that. <laughs> my iPhone says it's 90. Yeah, I believe, right. Apple. believe Apple. Probably the reason for this is that we just had a rainstorm blow through. Uh, well, your iPhone works. was in your pocket, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> so yeah. I'm going for 90 because yeah, that's probably yeah. what it is, or somewhere between 78 and 90. Uh, we're experiencing typical summer Florida weather here where we get yeah, yeah. rainstorms in the afternoon. Yep. 2.72. Plenty of rain there in Florida. Plenty. Yep. That's for a change. That you used to have droughty situations, right? We did for a number of years. Uh, that's why I really appreciate the rain. Because yeah, yeah. when there's too much drought, yeah. it creates all kinds of problems, not the least of which is drying up the basin where I keep my boat so I can't go sailing. <laughs> oh. It's hard to sail without water. Yeah. <laughs> we are now five days into summer here in the northern hemisphere. Happy yeah. summer. Happy summer. Better enjoy it because before you know it, it'll be over. September before yep. you know it. Right, Dixon? Isn't that how it goes? I think it does. It, it, the older you get, the faster it goes, too, I can tell you that. Well, and it's supposed to, It's supposed to. this weekend is supposed to be really crummy, and at least here yeah, it's supposed it to be cold. I, right now, it's pretty much cold. the same weather you have. But, exactly. Uh, it's supposed to drop into the low fif- lows the in the 50s. At night. Well, 60s here, 50s for you guys, right? Yeah. Oh, it's really nice when it's that cool at night. That's Trust it me. is. Yeah, but it's, it's, this is daytime temperature we're talking about now, I think. No, no, it'll be oh, it'll no. be just right barely on. in the 70s. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. We have some follow-up today. We have a follow-up from Chris who writes about TWIV 342. This podcast had a few mentions of Archaea, but neglected to credit them for the color of the, quote, non-GMO salt, <laughs> unquote. There are actual prehistoric DNA in that salt. Right. And he links to an article... Uh, in a website called Microbial Foods, and it's about exploring the diversity of extremely halophilic archaea in food-grade salts. Now, and this is actually a summary of a journal article in the International Journal of Food Microbiology, where they tried to isolate 
uh, archaea and archaeal DNA from various salts that they bought in the stores. Now, if you fly over uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, right. you'll see the salt ponds, that's right? right? That's right. Yep. And the, the various you colors will. of the drying, uh, the salt ponds are, are made by archaea. Yeah. So it turns out that many, many of these have culturable archaea, these salts in them. Good heavens. So they, they looked at 26 food grade commercial salts, salts and they found uh, salts grew colonies, over half of them. Wow. So now, does this include the, the salt that was mined? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, that it was, means deep in the ground? Yeah, there are two ways to make yeah, salt. Yeah. You can evaporate uh, seawater or you can dig it up out of the ground from prehistoric deposits. They say the highly refined salts didn't have any archaea. Right. I don't know about mined versus unmined, um, but I'll put a link to the article there and you can have a look. So it's got archaeal DNA. So, you know, it's really GMO salt. <laughs> but, yes, it is. <laughs> that's Probably. So funny. Isn't it funny, though? They're calling it non-GMO salt. Yeah. And everyone thinks it's so pure, <laughs> and it's got archaeal DNA in it. It's just funny. Uh, I, well, actually, I really appreciate this because, you know, we've got some of this salt in our house. And I was always yeah, wondering why it was pink. Right. Are you going to yep. still and, uh, use it, or are you worried about it, Rich? No, I'm not worried about anything. Good. Right? good. DNA is good right. for you. It is. No uh, worries, man. Chris is from Seattle, where I will tell you that it is cold, dark, cloudy, and drippy, even when it is not. <laughs> we want to move to a smaller house, and even those are horribly expensive because too many people are moving into my neighborhood. <laughs> yes, right. it's, it's a popular place. All right, Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Chaim writes, saying salt is kosher in, is in exactly the same category as saying it is gluten-free. <laughs> it, can, it can't not be. <laughs> Though, to be fair, there are certain people who won't eat anything that's not explicitly certified as kosher regardless. The same is probably true for gluten-free. What is called kosher salt is more accurately koshering salt, i.e. coarse salt that is used to help extract the blood from meat, a necessary, though not sufficient, step for it to be permitted for eating in accordance with kosher rules. Very interesting. And I'll say, you know, don't we learn just about everything here. This we is do. great. I, I had always wondered about that because... Yeah. You know, like Leviticus outlines all these prohibitions <laughs> on food, and I assume there must be something in there about salt, that that for some reason there was kosher salt. But no, it's all salt is kosher. It's just this is salt that's used for kosher processing. Mm -hmm. I didn't Interesting. Know that either. So this began with a comment about GMO foods weeks ago. It did. <laughs> yes. It did, it did. And this arc still, <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> so you realize that Lot's wife is the pillar of her community. Yes. Uh, right. Rich, can you, you just you just had to throw in an insult. There. I'm sorry. <laughs> can you take the next one, Rich? Kevin writes, Hi, Twiverinos. A quick follow-up comment regarding Rich Condit's pick from last week's episode, the so-called missing link between archaea and eukaryotes. The conversation seemed to perpetuate a common misconception about evolution that I wanted to quickly set right. Mm. Rich said that the current view is that eukaryotes, quote, evolved from, end quote, archaea, when in fact eukarya and archaea share a common ancestor more recently than with you bacteria. Right. Yes, right. And I'm, I'm really happy for that clarification. That's good. I know you guys know this, but this idea that any modern organism evolved from any other modern <laughs> organism, like humans evolved from AIDS, is a concept often misunderstood by biologists and non-biologists alike. Right. Incidentally, I'm also a bit perplexed by the fact that Carl Zimmer's article contained the phrase missing link, since he's written about the absurdity of that phrase in the past. <laughs> it's even more absurd, and he gives a link to uh, one of Carl's uh, articles. It's even more absurd to use this phrase for a modern organism. This makes the tree of life a bit more bushy in a place that it was bare. Maybe it's a Maybe it's a link, but it's not the link between our branch and Archaea. Cheers, Kevin from Audio Immunity. That's the <laughs> podcast. I know how to pronounce that. Yay, hey, Rich. Yeah, I still think it's a crappy name. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, I was online when you were typing below that, so I saw what you had to say. <laughs> so that's good. I appreciate that clarification. That's yes. great. Mm -hmm. good and point. just really well put. Yes. Yes, indeed. 
They share a common they, ancestor I, more recently than. Yes. I mean, even as I, even as I was talking about that, I was uh, wondering if I really had this right because it doesn't really sound right, and I really appreciate the clarification. Yeah. That's I good. don't know why Zimmer wrote that actually. It's in the, actually in the headline, I think, of the article. Right. The it's hard. Line. It's hard to get away from that phrase. Yeah. Writing about but, evolution. Uh, Kathy, take the next one, please. Dirk writes, Dear Virophils, just to let you know, there is a company in Estonia, protobios.com, that uses a similar approach, parentheses, serum, phage library, not, uh, next-gen next sequencing, and parentheses, to characterize the immunoprofile of a person. Interestingly, they use a random library of peptides on their phages with the idea of finding biomarkers for all types of diseases. It's a bit of a black box approach, but I can imagine that with a strong signal, one can work its way up to finding the antibody, finding the antigen, and perhaps the cause of the disease. They refer to it as MVA, mimetope variation analysis. Greetings from sunny Belgium, parentheses, with rain in the forecast, obviously, otherwise it would not be Belgium. Yeah. <laughs> really, it rains there, huh? Mm. Okay, that's cool. I didn't know this. Protobios.com. Let's take a look. Protobios. See what they. I, I I suspect they haven't published this since it's a company, right? Estonian. Hmm. Why not? It's founded eleven years ago, twelve years ago. Hmm. Uh, technology. Yeah. They don't have any um, references. This page is in Estonian. Would you like to translate it? Nope. <laughs> not, not right now anyway thank you all right we have some snippets for you do you guys like snippets sure yeah snippets yes. are good yeah. first one is a paper published in cell reports called grass plants bind retain uptake and transport infectious prions by pritzkow morales modicon telling hoover and soto from texas from fort collins and from italy is it is uptake a verb? Hmm. Mm. Uh, I would say take up. I wouldn't say. I would say take up. Yeah, I would too. I was surprised to see that. But there is an Italian author, so what can you do? <laughs> <laughs> I listen. I can insult Italians because I am one. Right. I'm first gen. Right. And so this is all about so prions. Did, we have talked about prions. You know, Dixon, you and I did a prion episode we a did. long time ago. A long. Time. And more recently, we talked about. Chronic wasting disease, yeah, cervid. of cervids. You know, right. deer, moose, elk have a prion disease, which is a neurodegenerative disease uh, right. transmitted by proteins that misfold and cause your protein to misfold. That's a prion. Mm. So the problem with the deer disease is that it's quite prevalent and seems to be increasing. And deer excrete prions in the urine and feces, and it, we're worried that they're going to transmit it to other animals uh, in the field if you know they contaminate grass and then cows go and eat the grass the cows could get it and then we eat cows of course and we could get it from the cows so uh, this paper actually looks at whether the prions can attach to plants and get in them <laughs> quite interesting we're, we're all thinking about getting prion diseases from meat but what about plants so uh, what they do here is they uh, take hamsters uh, who have developed fatal <laughs> prion diseases. It's a common animal model right, for prions. And then they, do, they make brain homogenates from these hamsters. And then they brush them onto plants. Um, they use mm -hmm. wheat plants, and or grass roots and leaves, sorry. And they uh, brush the brain homogenates on the plants, and then they wash them, and they find that it sticks to them pretty nicely. They can detect them and uh, they can spray homogenates on the plants and it will stick to them as well. And they can also can grow plants in soil in which they've put brain homogenates in. That's a weird <laughs> scenario there, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mixing your soil with brain homogenate. And the plants, plants, plants versus well, zombies. <laughs> you know, when you, get, when you bury something, doesn't that what happens? Yeah, basically? exactly. Yep, absolutely. So you can yeah. imagine a deer not just urinating or defecating, but dying, dying. right? The of course they all do. They all do. Anyway, the plants take up the prions, and you can detect them in the uh, upper parts of the plant. So they get in the roots and go up to the upper parts, the stem and the leaves, and you can detect them for up to 49 days. 
And they also, in one of these experiments, they grind up the plant tissues and feed them to hamsters. And the hamsters are like, oh, great, plants. And they they develop prion disease. I'm a vegan. I don't eat meat. It's the the circle of life. So this is quite interesting. Now, prion proteins are really stable, right? So it's not surprising that they will last for a long time in plants. Plants don't have their own prions, so it's not like these are propagating, but they're just staying there. So you, I imagine immediately deer getting into wheat or um, mm. cornfields yeah, yeah. and contaminating them and, and people getting prion diseases no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, from wait a eating vegetables. <laughs> Hang on a second. And Dixon, if you boil your corn, it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, no, I, I appreciate that. Isn't there some specificity here, though? What specificity? For servants. For the prion. Well, that's the question, Dixon. We don't know because no Just one has done it. the experiment of infecting <laughs> yeah, but this, this a human. Yeah, has been going with on the, for uh, a long time, though. No, there it hasn't, be, actually. We've only recently detected it. There should be other animals suffering from this besides There servants. isn't. Well, there are minks and uh, Ni- greater Nyala. <laughs> are those the same prions, though? <laughs> no, they're different. They're all that's different. what I thought. So, the so, question is, Dixon, we don't know if these could infect people. They, they can infect cows. You can infect cows with deer prions easily. You can in the laboratory, yeah. So cows they, could. Uh, get, how do they do this? They stick the, uh, they stick the cow prion in a mouse. Yes. Or uh, that's one of the models they use yes. to look for species specificity is to uh, take a uh, take a mouse and stick the prion of one species in it and then infect them with the prion of the other species and ask if they get the prion disease. It's not an infallible model, but right, I was right. interested to see that here. Hmm. So so if you put cow prions into mice, they get cuz cow prions have a broad host range. But human uh, prions don't go well into mice. You have to make them transgenic for the human prion protein. If you put deer prions into mice, they don't cause disease unless the mice are transgenic for the deer prion protein, right. et cetera. Which suggests that it's not very cross-species trend. It does. But right. if it went through cows, it that might, so if it goes from deer to cows, which we know works, um, it then could go from cows to people, right? So... It could bypass the uh, species barrier. Anyway, this is just another way that now, these how could many, spread. Now, how many of these prions are orally transmissible? Right. Well, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, right? Mad Kuru. cow disease is, mm-hmm. is Kuru is, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. If you feed scrapey right. uh, sheep to scrapey. cows, they get it. Um, so quite a few are. And yeah, I think oral transmission actually is pretty common. Yeah. Okay. Right. So I, I'm just, you know, you got to watch out. You, I think we ought to keep deer out of fields. Are you kidding me? Is that yeah, hard? Good luck Are with that. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, I used to go out fishing in um, Alberta almost every okay, summer. Okay, fine. Get prion disease. And you can't believe the number of mule deer that you can see in the evening in the fields. <laughs> well, put a fence up. Ha! They'll hop uh, right over it. Yeah. No, if you yeah. put a six-foot fence, they won't uh, hop over no, it. No, no. More like twelve That's and barbed true. wire on the top. And really? That's true. They, they <laughs> will get through... Everything. They're, uh, yeah, my they're um, they're my in-laws good. have a house that's in Westchester County, right, just north of New York City, mm. built-up area. It's a suburban area with a golf course, and uh, but there's a forest, right. and the place is infested of with deer. Of course. They're everywhere. You there's can't no drive way. up there without seeing four or five of them wandering around They've in the middle of the road. They've predator species. Um, because hmm. all the predators are gone because right. it's all built up and, the and can't be there's done. no hunting allowed. Right. So they actually have had to bring in um, sure. professional hunters to That's cull right. the deer herd. There's just nothing to do about them. And my in-laws have put up, they've tried putting up fences in front of their, their bushes because the deer eat everything, including the stuff that's supposed to be deer-proof and toxic. And they just devour any kind of underbrush or flowers. They're or evolving. <laughs> they're, they're is, it, they are very, very hard to stop. They're roaches with hooves. Maybe that's how the prions spread among deer in part, <laughs> through plants. Who knows? Who Maybe. Knows? So we what? put up a six-foot fence, which the fence guy said would keep deer out. But our neighbor has a four-foot fence, so they jump over that instead. <laughs> my father's well, right. if your neighbor my, has a shorter fence, you're okay. Yeah. <laughs> my father's solution to this was to put a dog inside the fence. Right. That'll work. <laughs> yeah, that works. So our neighbor has this spiky uh, four-foot fence, right? And it, one deer we once jumped over and got, <sighs> and it was just hanging there oh, by its oh, leg. No. So my neighbor came over. She said, "What should I do?" I said, "Call the police." And the guy came and he exactly. shot the deer. Yeah. 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 It was really sad. He was just hanging by the leg. Yeah. Uh, 
Because you, you shouldn't put fences with those decorative spikes on the no. top. Well, know? it stopped the deer, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. So one thing I liked about this paper was the uh, assay for prions, which, uh, as I think about it, I, th- I I have been exposed to before, but I, f- I forgot about it. And it's an amplification assay that allows you to detect small amounts of prions right. where you, where you s- uh, seed a normal uh, uh, homogenate with a little bit of prion, and the prion uh, converts the... Uh, uh, homologous protein, the normal yep. protein and the uh, homogenate to a prion-like protein, oh and you keep doing God. that, yep. adding more normal stuff, and it amplifies the prion, and then you can uh, then you can see it in quotes, right? Detect it. Yep. Uh, I really like that. Yeah. So a guy out at Rocky Mountain uh, Labs uh, was part that of Bruce that. Bruce Cheesebro. Uh, he and another guy, Brian Cawhe, Byron Cawhe, they developed it. And uh, so TWIV 299, he talks about that asset. Oh, okay. And I think we did another prion um, episode mm-hmm. more recently, okay. right? I can't. Don't know. They come up once in a while. Now, when people pass these prions through other species, is that a gain of function experiment? Uh, yeah, it is. It changes uh, the host point. range. It changes the host range, doesn't yeah. it? Yep. Mm-hmm. Quake in your boots, folks. Dear, dear. Anyway, it's quite interesting, isn't it, that these mm-hmm. uh, get taken up? Very. Okay, so they're at taken the, at up. At the end of this, they basically have a paragraph about epidemiological studies, and I would say from that that the epidemiological studies are, I love this phrase, not inconsistent with the notion <laughs> that right. uh, uh, they could be spread plant. Uh, but, you know, in, through uh, plant matter. And, and by the way, this is a Cell Reports paper. In contrast to the rest of Cell, um, this is open access. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Now, um, one last thing here. The incidence of this disease in surveys is going up, Dixon. Yeah. So it seems to be spreading amongst them. So they're, and with all these deer, you know, it's just a matter of time. I know you can't keep them out of fields, but... You can't. Or off the bumpers of your cars. Oh, I know how to keep them out of our food, Dixon. Yeah, go on. Let's grow our vegetables in vertical farms. <laughs> yes. That's that how you work, keep actually. the deer out, right? That would work. But can you grow corn in a vertical farm? Sure. Wheat? Yep. Barley? You bet. Broccoli? Name anything. Tomatoes? Keep going. Potatoes. This is going to be a long show, folks. Potatoes? <laughs> yeah, there's, some, there's some things you can't grow. Walnuts. Right? Name, name one. Yeah. Walnuts? Walnuts. Well, you could. You wouldn't want to grow a tree indoors, but you could if you really had to. If you really yeah, to. mangoes. How about mangoes, Dixon? <laughs> oh, okay. You got me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Bananas? Uh, sure. In fact, I don't think deer dwarf... are a big problem on the uh, mango farms. They, they don't enjoy the bananas too <laughs> much. The lions either. take no, them the, out. The bats right. are yeah, the problem there, there right? Yeah. 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 Okay, our next snippet is a paper, actually... Um, I think someone suggested it. Yes, here we go. Pyatt writes, Hi, team from Stellenbosch, South Pete. Africa. Pete? Pete. Look, we've had this discussion before. Some people <laughs> say Pyatt. Okay? No way. Pete My mother Mondrian said is Pete, Pete Mondrian is Pete Mondrian, okay? And that's how he spelled his name. How do you know? All right, he was a friend of mine. How do you know he pronounced it that way? <laughs> Who, whoever out there knows. How about you, Pyatt or Pete? Is it always Pete, Pete or is it sometimes Pyatt? Tell us. Anyway, he's from Stellenbosch. Could you, could you please repyat that? <laughs> South Africa, where it's currently cold, 17C, fair, slightly overcast, wind speed roughly 14 kilometers per hour. I really enjoy the podcast and appreciate all the effort you guys have put into it. It is a brilliant mix of humor and fun science. Brilliant. Yeah, I heard that word. <laughs> I'm currently working in bioinformatics, coming from a finance and statistics background. I have therefore learned a lot from the show, and I'm continuously amazed at the intricate, eloquent dynamics of the host. I, I'm sorry, of molecular interactions. <laughs> <laughs> the show has given me a newfound appreciation for traffic. Right. I guess he, he listens while he drives. Yeah. Found this interesting paper on flu, which highlights some interesting aspects of the epidemiology, as well as the stratification of infected individuals based on age of the host and rate of mutation of the virus. All right, so he sent the paper, uh, a letter in Nature Global. And by the way, I find it amusing that somebody is considering 17C cold. <laughs> right. Just saying. South Africa, right? Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, global circulation patterns of seasonal influenza viruses vary with antigenic drift. A, a lot of authors from many different places. Um, 
and what they've done here is to look at global um, isolates of influenza virus, which, you know, the WHO has many, many sampling laboratories all over the world, and they generate isolates and sequences. And this is all put in a database, which you can mine as you wish. And they want to look at patterns of global circulation, right? And they've looked at H3N2 and H1N1 viruses, uh, which are both circulating uh, at the moment. And um, <clears throat> it's a lot of uh, phylogenetic trees and various statistical analyses in establishing models and testing them. Uh, but what they find is that the, the circulation patterns of the H1N1 are different from H3N2. All right, I, th I think that's quite interesting. So H3N2s don't persist between global epidemics. They get reseeded from East and Southeast Asia. All right, so here in the north we have a flu season. The virus is gone, and then it's reseeded. However, differently, H1N1 seem to persist uh, across multiple seasons. All right, and there's, uh, you know, East and Southeast Asia, which seed the H3N2, play a minor role in disseminating new H1N1 variants. I think that's quite interesting that these it two, is. two, we think of them as influenza viruses, different you know, subtypes, but they have very different dynamics globally. Aren't, there, aren't these bird-driven uh, species? I think these are reseeded by uh, human traveling. You do? Yes, I do. Or why is there a seasonality then, since we have no seasons for travel? That's a good question, Dixon. Don't Thank you think you it might much. have to do? Well, does that answer your question automatically? No, because no, what I want to no, know it's is, because there are obviously factors uh, that affect transmission and susceptibility that we don't understand. Yeah, but uh, like uh, relative humidity, for example, which we've talked about here on Twitter. Well, but if if H one N one is not being constantly introduced by travelers coming in for each new season, yeah. then where is it hanging out during Correct. the off season? Well. Uh, Peter Palazzi tells me that uh, some of these viruses are always present uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, even through the summer. He said, if you went into a big city, Chicago, New York, you would be able to isolate influenza viruses. And I, and I would guess they would be H1N1 and not H3N2. So, so H1N1 H1. is just better at circulating in the off-season? Perhaps. Perhaps. It's not birds, Dixon. You're sure? Okay. It, it is not birds. You're sure? I'm not sure, but That's it's not I birds. <laughs> I, I, I'm racking my brain because I, in the last couple of days, I just saw some paper or map with a map about how uh, uh, global travel routes and, and relating it to, I thought, influenza specifically. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was a paper. It was something from Emory. Yeah, because it was sort of, I think, uh, emanated from Atlanta. I don't know. Anyway, just that people are doing research on the actual geography relating to the transmission. So the other aspect of this paper is that they looked at data and find that um, H1N1 viruses tend to infect younger individuals than H3N2 viruses. And they think that's because there's less antigenic diversity among H1N1, and that means the adults, as you age, you know, you get immune and you don't get reinfected, whereas the new pool of kids that are introduced constantly, uh, they get infection. And they say, you know, kids don't travel as much, <laughs> and that may be a part of why, you know, you, you don't have this mm -hmm. receding every year. But I'm, I'm not sure that that's, that's the explanation. And why would there be less antigenic diversity in H1N1 than uh, the H3 viruses. Is this the measles thing I again? Was say. <laughs> I don't think it is. I think their argument would be that um, there there is less pressure from the population. Well, they don't actually say that, but that's what I would guess. There's less there's less selection pressure maybe for H1N1 than H3N2. I, I don't know, but I find the idea that kids don't travel not it's not convincing because. No. Adults do get infected, and they travel, right? It's not like there's zero infections in adults, yeah. so they should spread it as well. I right. remembered what it was. It's a PLOS Pathogens paper, mm -hmm. and um, but I'm looking at the Emory news release page. It has to do with uh, people commuting. So mobility of people uh, has a lot to do with the spread of influenza, evidently. Mm. I put the link in the show okay. there. Anyway, so that's pretty interesting. Um, 
and they say at the end that could maybe explain lots of viral transmissions. We have a lot of data for flu. That's the cool thing here. You couldn't do this uh, right. not too long ago, but now we've got this, these data. We've got sequences, and then you can make these trees, and you could look at uh, what comes from where. It's pretty neat. Right. <clears throat> All right. Uh, then uh, and some weeks ago, uh, we got an email from Steen, who um, is one of our listeners, and he is a virologist. And, in, in fact, um, the paper we're going to do is from his laboratory. And he wrote, Dear Twiviridae, plant RNA silencing is going through a bit of a rough patch. We could really use a twiv bump for a new paper from our lab published in PLOS Pathogens. Now, the rough patch, he gives a link to a story in Lab Times Online, which I had not known about. Maybe Alan did. I only tangentially heard bits and pieces of this. I didn't know the scale of it. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I follow I follow like Retraction Watch, and there's always some stuff going on like that. But I I didn't realize that there was this one nexus of hmm. of this going. So on. I was a, I was aware of this, but I don't know why. So a, a professor in Zurich, Olivier Voinet, who's a plant virologist and well regarded, has published extensively, um, has had a wave of uh, accusations of fraud of various sorts that have been documented here and also in Retraction Watch. And Over this, a long uh, period of time. Over a period of yes. time, you know, and do, they, do, they do. have gels that look to be manipulated and so forth. Um, I was 30, just totally, 30 publications yeah, are yeah. Have called into it's question. amazing. That so. sure is a rough patch. Now, this is a guy who was, you know, considered to be a wonderful star and great future and all that. Mm. So I asked him just this week, what's the story? He said, uh, no investigation results have been released. Um, you asked who? Uh, Steen. Because okay. I figured he'd be on top of this, right? Being right. I think I think Olivier is not talking to anybody. Right. So there's a second lab journal piece, uh, and then several figure mix-ups have been corrected. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven links he sends, Eek. and the most heavily criticized paper has been retracted. That was mm-hmm. published in Plant Cell. So um, yes, retracted. And the original title was Probing the Microrna and Small Interfering RNA Pathways with Virus-Encoded Suppressors of RNA Silencing. So this, this is a rough patch, yeah. And this is one person, and it, apparently he's affecting you know his lab members as well. Yeah. So this is not good. You should not do this. All right. That's anyway, right. so I thought we could give them a twiv bump. So I thought we would do this paper. And he writes, as you and your listeners may know, small RNAs were discovered in the context of plant virus infection and transgene silencing. Less often appreciated is that plant virologists predicted an RNA-based immune system as early as 1993. And he gives a, a link for that. In 1998, three groups demonstrated that podiviral helper component protease, HC Pro, suppresses RNA silencing, providing a clear demonstration that RNAi functions in defense. As previously noted, uh, these discoveries demonstrate the importance of fundamental research, including plants, fungi, etc. And so this paper um, deals in part with the function of this antagonist, HC Pro. Um, He says, we use the proverbial, quote, awesome power, unquote, of reverse (laughs) genetics to dissect (laughs) argonaut function in Arabidopsis Thaliana, the species in which the argonaut proteins were first described. Many plant microRNAs target develop me- developmentally important transcription factors, so when the main argonaut, Argo-1, is non-functional, you get messed up plants. The original mutants were named because they look like argonaut squids. <laughs> Interference with microRNA regulation is a likely explanation for why many viruses stunt plant development. We showed that at least three argonauts bind small RNAs derived derive from the turnip mosaic virus genome, but only in the absence of functional HC Pro. Uh, so he says, fun fact, your guest Jack Morris, which we had on TWIV from Nebraska, was Jim Carrington's PhD supervisor, who was the PI on this paper. Hmm. And Hernan, who is the lead author on the paper, has moved into Jack's old lab at University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Cool. They should have. I, re- I really like this. Interference with microRNA regulation is a likely explanation for why many viruses stunt plant development. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's neat. They do that. Right? You see the classic pictures. All right, so we're going to do this paper. Dixon Arabidopsis 
Thaliana. Yeah. Now, we had a little chat before. I called we it did. a weed, right? You did. <laughs> <laughs> so what is a weed, Dixon? A weed is a plant that farmers hate. But oh, I, I heard a weed is any plant you. growing where you don't want it. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, exactly. that's what Dixon that's said, right. too. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Because in nature, weeds are actually part of a robust, interconnected ecosystem, which together they um, maintain uh, a large variety of life forms, and uh, Rabidopsis is one of them. You know, I knew a guy uh, a long time ago who worked on a Rabidopsis, and he actually yeah, called too. it a weed. I said, what is this yeah. plant? He said, that's ah, a weed. But no, we, <laughs> remember what we ended up saying? Yeah, what did you dr- say? It's, it's the Drosophila of the plant world. Yeah, I guess, right? So here's a, it's the, uh, it's an angiosperm, by the way, Vincent. What's an angiosperm? (laughs) (laughs) A flowering plant. Ah. (laughs) And there are over 400,000 species of flowering plants, and they arose some 130 million years ago. Now, how would in I contrast to the gymnosperms. Exactly right, which can only be found in gyms, so you don't have to worry about them anyway. So, yeah, that's right. So, so how did Arabidopsis become the Drosophila of the Easy plant? Easy to grow. Small Easy genome. Grow. Small genome compared to most plants, which have large genomes. Mm. And you can manipulate. You can make transgenic plants. And right? you can, yeah, they're harder to do. it. In the beginning, it was very hard work, but now they've worked out. That's right. Times. A lot of plants are multiploid, aren't they? they so sure you have are. to deal with uh, more yeah. than just two copies of everything. That's right. And they're slow growing. That's opposed to the plant, you know, the bacteria or viral world. Even the parasite world is a little bit faster in most cases than most flowering plants. So, you, you know. You, there are drawbacks to to experimental models. This one has its share of them. Hmm. Um, the thing here, Dixon, is that uh, I, I understand model systems, right? Yeah. Is it true that Arabidopsis lies and I don't know what what? Remember, we say mice lie, monkeys exaggerate. <laughs> Petunias. <laughs> Petunias exaggerate. These Petunias are another plant model. Uh, Arabidopsis are embarrassed by off color jokes. And turnips don't say much of anything. <laughs> no, nah, they right. don't. So they work on. The, In fact, the, they turn up their nose to almost everything. Ooh. Ooh. Tur- turnip. Uh, you had mosaic. to root around for that one. I did. I did. <laughs> oh, boy. They're coming really fast. It's true. Turnip uh, mosaic virus is the virus used in this study. Yes. Of course, in this paper, we don't have any turnips. No. And I just wanted to say at the outset, I understand model systems, but yeah. I don't know, maybe it's too hard to infect turnips and do studies. Well, it's but too easy to infect. In fact, it happens all the time outside. That's why they're working you know, on it. <laughs> this is a, as you will see, this is a complicated situation here where there are yes. subtle differences, but right. not, maybe they're not relevant if it's in the wrong host for the virus, right? You could say that. Uh, and maybe you should also look in other, I'm sure you guys who do plant virology know this, but as an outsider, my first view is like, why don't you do the virus in the right host? I th- I just off the top of my head, uh, Arabidopsis is a tiny little plant, and yes, turnips you really I need understand. to grow in more space. So it's more of a you know why don't you why don't you do all your experiments in in I don't know dogs instead of mice. Yeah, but I a, understand. Alan, I understand. the the Alton Jones Science Center uh, up in Lake Placid specialized in plant biology, and they had single cell tissue culture systems. You could take a, a turnip cell and grow it up on an agar plate right. and use that as your experimental model if that's what you really wanted to do, I think. But you can't show effects on developmental biology that way. Right. You can't get, you can't get it through its whole life cycle no. in a small right. space. You exactly. need a bigger space. So, and, and Arabidopsis is better characterized in its right. standard system. Well, right. I mean, animal virology has similar... Uh, you could make similar, similar things. things, criticisms yeah. as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, we uh, study polio and HeLa cells, which are certainly not the, the natural host. <laughs> and we try and get around it by doing experiments in relevant cells when we can. Yeah. Um, and, and, I, and I'm sure that plant virologists are aware of this, but I, and I'm just sure that you're going to discover different things if you use the right virus-host combination. Sure, I'm right? sure you're right. Now, of course, th- this paper is about RNA silencing, and a lot of the work is directed at understanding it so that maybe you could use it right. to control pests, that's right? right? That's right. And so you get to test some of the things, that, and if they don't work, then you say, well, it must be a virus-specific host interaction. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, mm-hmm. this is agriculturally driven in part, right? And in fact, they even say in this paper that you know we're hoping to use this at some point. Yeah. So um, this is about RNA silencing, and in plants, there are, there are small RNAs that are made in the by the plant uh, from their genome that are regulatory, right? They regulate gene yeah. expression, just as we make small RNAs that are regulatory. But in addition, when plants get infected by 
viruses, they use the small RNA system to defend against infection. And uh, the plants take the double-stranded RNA produced during viral infection. They they chop it up by uh, dicer and like enzymes, uh, and then one strand is picked up by the argonaut proteins and then used to guide it to the uh, mRNA. And the argonaut then degrades the RNA, and that yeah. inhibits gene expression. Yeah. So it's an antiviral defense, and we there's good evidence for this because many plant viruses have these. And the so-called antagonistic protein, of which HC Pro is one of them, that suppresses RNA silencing. And whether this happens in mammalian cells, that is, whether RNA is an antiviral defense, is quite controversial. We mm. we did a paper or two papers last year about this on TWIV, and we I don't think anything has been published since about that. Remember that was quite a controversial issue. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. sure maybe we'll hear about it at ASV. Who knows? Mm. Uh, anyway, so you this, ought to know. I ought to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Kathy knows. She puts together the program. Uh. <laughs> don't, 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 don't remind her. After the tornado, it's all a, a, a wash. <laughs> Actually, in my morning, uh, so I do the morning symposia. Um, I don't have anyone who's going to uh, talk about this. So it's up to the uh, afternoon talks. A lot of what you were just saying, it just popped into my mind, sounds uh, reminiscent of the ubiquitin system for getting rid of uh, proteins that you don't want. I mean, this sounds a little bit like a mechanism that might have evolved into something else over a great deal of time, of course, to give animal cells a chance at monitoring their own cellular functions. Because um, plants are, have been around a long time uh, compared to animals. Just wanted to throw that mm-hmm. out as a thought. Piece. So the topic of this uh, paper are the argonaut proteins, and uh, Arabidopsis has 10 argonaut genes. So they want to figure out, do these all have a role in defending against virus infection? And remember that they're probably not all just for viruses because these also regulate um, yeah. plant gene expression, right? There are small RNAs, well, as I said, made, and the argonauts bind those to regulate expression They talk well. about pseudomonas, too, in the paper, so that maybe it's bacterial as well. Yeah, what are they, Dixon? What are bacteria? Uh, those are higher forms of viruses. Yes. <laughs> Argonaut 2 is required for resistance to pseudomonas syringae right. in Arabidopsis. Right. So... Um, What they do here is they can knock out these genes in plants. They can make transgenic plants very readily, and they can infect them with viruses. So that's, among other things, just to go back to this, why you use Arabidopsis. Yeah. Right. I wonder if there are any Arabidopsis viruses that one (laughs) might be able to use. Because, you know, the host Uh, here is just so uh, malleable that, you know, you're kind of, that that's the place to go. Yep. All right. So they had um, they they do infections of these plants, and I just I wanted to tell you guys about this because it's a little different from animal cells right. infecting with viruses because you know plant <clears throat> viruses don't get into plant cells by receptors and, and endocytosis and all that. They usually get in by vectors or damage of some sort. And in the laboratory, you actually have to rub the virus <laughs> into the plant leaves, and they call this. Rub inoculation. <laughs> That's right. And I found, enough. I found a video in YouTube of a guy doing this. They dust, they, they, they spray carborundum onto the leaves, yeah. which mm-hmm. is a, an ear grinding right, compound. Grinding compound. Exactly. And so they have this guy with a little face mask on, and he's making this aerosol of carborundum oh my gosh. In, in the greenhouse. And then. It's kind of like a big, big. Industrial scale salt shaker. That yeah, exactly. And shakes then, the carborundum on. So for the virus, they basically ground up some leaves, and he stuck a piece of cotton into it to soak up the virus, and and he rubbed it on the leaves. Of course, you can do it more precisely because here they say they use three microliters of virus. But basically, you yeah. he rubbed the cotton on the plants four times to <laughs> and that inoculates it. Rub inoculation. Interesting. It's pretty funny. Yeah. Oh. Watching him do this, I got you know I got the sense that cross contamination. Yeah. Might be, you know, I wonder how often your mocks get infected. But, you know, You'd maybe have to you're be very careful. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that it, it, other people. So Steen can tell us. I'm sure he'll write in and tell us. The, uh, yeah, not only do you rub inoculate them, but then afterwards you go through and you you, you rinse them all off, okay? So you got to have virus all over the place. Right. Yeah. yeah. So here, the, the idea is they have these plants lacking each argonaut 
gene. They've knocked it out. And they infect them with the turnip mosaic virus, which is a pote virus, right? And this is these are RNA viruses, plus strand RNA viruses. They have, they look sort of like picornas. They have a VPG at the five prime end and a poly A tail, and a single long R plus stranded RNA. They put GFP in them, and they inoculate the plants, and they can see virus replication by mm. green fluorescence, right? Mm. And they have pictures of the leaves <laughs> that right. you can very nicely yeah. see, yeah, yeah. you know. And these are, they, so for example, if you take a uh, wild-type virus onto a uh, plant, you get a nice, um, get some patchy green on the leaf. And then, then uh, they, look at the, they look at a virus lacking this antagonist, this HC Pro. <clears throat> and then they infect all the uh, Argonaut deletions uh, with that. And you can see some of the Argonaut deletions uh, allow replication, like number two and, and number seven and... Etc. And some of them, when you knock out, doesn't matter. The virus uh, is not replicating anything. So, in the normal plant, if you knock out HC Pro, the virus can no longer overcome right. the plant's defense system, exactly. and it right. grows just fine. Right. But mm-hmm. in the wild, in the on the left leaf there, uh, that's I'm sorry. The, I'm sorry. It's it, it doesn't grow. It. Did. <laughs> the virus you knock out again, the virus is HC Pro, <laughs> right. and the virus does not grow. That's right. In a wild right. type plant. Right. right. And so you have to knock it out to look at the effect of these argonauts. Otherwise, right. you're not going to get any right. growth, right? But the wild-type virus will grow in a wild-type plant because it's got the antagonistic protein. It grows mm-hmm. quite well, mm-hmm. which makes you wonder, you know, does the virus always win in nature? You know, and maybe no this is different in a turnip. I mean, what, you know, yeah. what covers that? But anyway, so you, can, you have a nice assay for asking which... Um, Argonauts are important when you look at the leaf that you've inoculated. And then you can look at spread to other parts of the plant, right? Mm -hmm. And they look, that's what they call systemic infection, right? Because as far as I know, Dixon, the roots and the leaves and the stems, they're all connected, right? They (laughs) are. (laughs) (laughs) They have transport systems, right? They do. Xylem and phloem, right? That's correct. This is where I had to look up all these terms. So what did you learn, Rich? (laughs) Well, I learned that... Uh, they talk about infecting the rosette leaves and then looking for systemic spread to the uh, colleen leaves and the inflorescence. And I'm right. thinking, uh, that's the flower. Yes. <laughs> so, and no, I right, want right. you to know that I actually made it here on the left here, okay? Because oh, you made I it, yeah. Find a satisfactory one. So, this plant grows, it really does look like a weed, okay? It's got a <laughs> bunch of. Uh, uh, it is a weed. A, a bunch of leaves that are, lie very close to the ground. Right. And a stem that grows up out of that. And there are a few leaves on that stem and then uh, uh, flowers at the top. So the rosette leaves are the ones at the base of the stem that lie close to the ground. Yeah. The leaves that are on the stem growing upwards are the colleen leaves. And they come and, from the Latin word collis, which means stem. Hmm. Ah, excellent. Uh, and then inflorescence is, I gather, anything to do with a flower. Correct. Yeah. Okay? Yep. So if you inoculate the rosette leaves on the bottom and then assay for infection of either the colleen leaves on the stem or the <laughs> inflorescence uh, at the tip, you're um, assaying for systemic spread of the virus. Here, here. Right. Kathy, now, if you were you... doing this with turnips, you would just take blood samples. Exactly. Uh. Uh. <laughs> Kathy, did you work on plant viruses for a while? No, I no? didn't, but I had friends that did, and then the lab next to mine at Georgia was a plant lab, and so I knew several been... people that worked on Arabidopsis. So you absorbed all this stuff? <laughs> yeah. Right. You were robot, rub inoculated? Yeah. Are you rub inoculated? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it and, flowed uh, into her. And I'd heard about Salix before. That's the fruit and the picture on the right. Ah, yep. nice. So you can ask the Argonauts, do they have a role in local multiplication or in spread? And so you can so interrogate them. You can interrogate them. <laughs> what are you doing here? So, um, and they, they go through all these. Like Argonaut 2 is a really important one for uh, both local uh, multiplication. Um, where is the spread here? And, and um, for spreading, so if you take away... Uh, Argonaut, uh, this thing, um, Argonaut 2, the, the virus isn't spread very well. And there there's subtle differences. Some are more powerful than others. The combinations work in some cases. Some are good for local. Some are good for spread. 
So this is what I meant earlier by it's a um, it's a complicated situation. And so in part why you have so many of them is to deal with different parts of the plants. I think also some of these argonauts are virus specific, right? Some of them work for some viruses and not others. So they also made combinations <clears throat> of these argonaut deletions uh, and looked at them. And they saw some were not additive, some are additive. And again, they look at local and systemic multiplication. I think that, you know, the details are are not as important as understanding that they find differences and some are, are more important as, than others. Uh, so they have, in the end, two sets of Argonauts um, that limit infection. Uh, Argonaut 2 is a, is, has a major role in um, in inoculated rosettes, which are the leaves down by the ground, and non-inoculated choline leaves, which are farther up the stem, uh, while 5, 7, and 10 have minor roles, and they are not additive with 2. In non-inoculated inflorescence tissues, those are at the top of the plant, 1 in 10 play overlapping or redundant roles. And so that's part of the initial conclusions of this paper. And they really don't understand all the connections between these no. or why they should have roles in different places, That's right, and et cetera. Yeah. That's going to take further work. Mm -hmm. I and uh, yeah. I think it's also noteworthy that, you know, these these uh, argo proteins uh, are dealing with the cellular microRNAs as well mm -hmm. uh, and may have other functions right. as well. So they aren't necessarily all there just to deal with virus infections and that's a major thrust of this study is that which ones of these proteins mm -hmm. are dealing with virus infections and in fact they've got background information here that suggests some different argo proteins may deal with different viruses okay so there may yes, be exactly. uh, in fact different of these argonaut proteins that uh, deal with different viruses for reasons unknown that's why it would be interesting to look in turnips right yeah sure Mm -hmm. Maybe a whole different story. Maybe yeah, a di sure. totally different story, right? Yeah. So, uh, well, Vincent, I'll... you know, you got a project. <laughs> no, it's not. Are you going to give that one to Dixon? No, he's going to turn up his nose at it. So, uh, I have a question about the argonauts altogether. Are they all proteins that are related to each other in terms of structure, at least? Are they derived from the same alleles? Do they locate to the same chromosomes? What is the uh, basis for the diversity of argonauts? I'm afraid I can't answer that. Understood. How far back? In plant I know biology, in can fact, you different, go? In fact, different plants have different numbers. In fact, they say, what did he it's say in like his... Rice uh, or something has 19. 19 in rice, yeah. So plants have different numbers. Right. Um, you know, they have homology. That's why they're all argonaut, okay. right? But whether they arose by duplication or what, you know, I don't know. I'm so not familiar with it. Do non-flowering plants have argonauts also? No, I mean, just Do non-flowering plants mm. have argonauts? Well, I would say yes, because they still have to regulate their own gene they expression, do, they and they do. have to block virus infection. So yeah. I would, I yeah. would guess yes, although I don't know the answer. Okay. I'm just looking it up now. Aha. I'm also trying to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. Uh, are, the gymnosperms <laughs> are ferns. Well, right? they can ferns be. Can be, yeah. can be, yes. Well, and conifers. And right, right. And uh, while you're All doing the that, I can t start to tell you about the second part of this paper. Where Which they, is really cool. They, uh, they look <laughs> for the small RNAs that are actually produced in cells. And they have two approaches to doing this. The first is that they, they, have, um, they will immunoprecipitate Argonaut 2, which we said is a very important defense against this virus, and then look sequence the small RNAs that are bound to it. Nice. So, a pull-down experiment. It's a pull-down, right? They they actually put an nice. epitope tag onto argonauts, and they can use that to pull it down. And argonauts are binding these small RNAs, and they can just sequence them and see <clears throat> what they, they are. Have to not, not only do they put an epitope tag on the protein and make a transgenic plant with it, but it's a mutant, <laughs> an engineered mutant of the protein that will still bind right. the the silencing RNA, and it will still bind the target RNA, but not... Cleave, cleave. It, right. Otherwise, you wouldn't okay. be able to infect. Otherwise, them, right? you wouldn't be able to do it. So this right. is very cool. This is really a GMO. <laughs> yeah, if you um, wanted to eat seriously. a weed, <laughs> would you eat a weed, Dixon? <laughs> I have many times oh, inadvertently. They are, they are edible. They're, they're mustard greens. Oh, look at you. Uh, yeah. They're a kind of. of I mean, they're of similar to mustard. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Argonaut proteins are conserved through all domains of life. Look at that. Yeah. 
Schizosaccharomyces Schizo pombi expresses one argonaut subfamily protein. I was going to ask, no was gonna ask uh, about that. That's yeah. yeast. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that is the yeast used to make um, mm -hmm. probably the original beer. Right. Mm. So they sequence these small RNAs brought down by Argonaut 2. And there are two kinds, right? They're the plant small RNAs, which they look at extensively to make sure everything is right. They get the right lengths and they get known microRNAs. And they basically show these are the RNAs we would expect to be brought down to with Argonaut 2. So it looks like the whole approach works well, right? Mm. Then they infect uh, these plants with turnip mosaic virus and do the same experiment. They pull down the small RNAs with Argonaut and they see lots of viral specific RNA sequences in there. Um, it's a, and they have something like 17 to 23% of all the reads are viral. The rest are cellular microRNAs. Uh, they do find that um, they are depleted in immunoprecipitates, the viral Com RNAs, right? Right, compared to the input. Uh, this is a little yeah. beef that I had as I was reading it. It said they're depleted in immunoprecipitates, and I was like, compared, compared to, to what? Yes, right. <laughs> so it's less than you would expect, right, basically? Right. Right. So yeah. not everybody is binding Argonaut 2, which is what you would conclude from that, right? Highly enriched. Wait a minute. Go back over that again, because I had trouble with the quantitation here. Yes. Uh, I did, by trouble, I mean I didn't understand it. All right. So, so <laughs> what you're telling me is that it's only a subset of yeah, the right. total uh, total micro RNAs that are made by during the infection That's that are right. immunoprecipitated by Argo two. That's right. Right. That's okay. Correct. That's correct. Only a subset of those and, RNAs and are that, associating that, with Argo two. Yeah. And that seems to be a, a specific subset? Because, no, then they map all these things and they come from all over the place. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, so they map them to both strands across the entire genome. Hmm. That's the total um, uh, siRNA, virus-derived siRNAs. But the when you then immunoprecipitate with Argonaut, you only get a subset of those. Okay. I don't know. They, they probably did look at where the subset is from. Um, here, you can look at these do. figures and you can see. I, I think they're just, um, it's still across the genome. There's yeah. some hot spots, but it's reduced overall, right? Right. It's figure 3C, panels 3 and 4. Yeah. So what's the basis for the binding? It, there's it's a part of the sequence. protein that binds. It's not. It's obviously not sequence specific, right? Nope. There's an RNA binding groove in this So protein. every time they yeah. do it, would they get a different mix? Um, I think you would get the same results if you did this over or over, over time over. if the virus infection is synchronous i think you get the same result dixon right right so that's kind of strange then right why because well, the viral genome is a constant right and you're just chopping it up and yeah binding no it no, no I, I i got it but um i don't know why you're worried about that Explain. I guess I'm not worried about it at all. Okay. I don't know enough to be worried about that. Well, neither do we. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like rich. <laughs> you can ask questions. It's okay. It's no, I'm trying to envision how this works. That's all. Yeah. The virus enters the cell. It starts to replicate. It's, it makes more genomes. And the argonaut starts to bind the genomes. And then it aggregates. And then it's all chopped up by a slicer or a dicer. Actually, what happens is first right? is D Dicer comes in first, first. Dicer, okay, Dicer. and Dicer. chops up all of the chops up the double stranded uh, genomes into model. small pieces that then get loaded into Argonaut oh, okay. and assembled into this uh, uh, risk. Uh, what is it? What, I forget yeah, what yeah, risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, RNA induced silencing complex that right. then travels to the genomes and binds them and cleaves them. Targeted by the RNA slices. Yeah. So remember, they have wild type virus, and they also have the mutant, mutant ah, that lacks right. the antagonist. And they can compare uh -huh. the small RNAs in both, and they conclude that the binding of viral derived siRNAs to Argonaut two is inhibited in the presence of the antagonist. And they can see that in the sequence yeah. analysis, which yeah. you would expect. So that's a nice confirmation. So that is a species, That's a sequence specific deal, then, right? No, it's a, it's uh, actually no. You'll find out. Oh, okay. It relates to the the mutant virus has a mutation in the HC pro, and so therefore it's not interacting with the RNAs, which is non-specific for sequence. So, 
Yes, so yes, what you, so what you know at this point is that uh, the uh, small RNAs that are made by Dicer during the virus replication get loaded onto uh, uh, in the absence of this inhibitory protein in the absence of the viral inhibitory protein get loaded onto Argonaut okay mm-hmm. but the inhibitory protein prevents that from happening somehow we don't know how yet but we will know <laughs> uh, they also did this experiment with Argonaut 1 and 10 so we've just looked at pull down with Argonaut two, right? And they same approach, pull down sequence. <clears throat> they find that um, infection triggers small RNAs, virus derived RNAs for both strands across the genome. They're depleted in both Argonaut one and ten immunoprecipitase, just like for yeah. Argonaut two. Um, <clears throat> And they they conclude that argon ten may target all regions of the genome. So maybe some argonauts are, as you might as you were suggesting, Dixon, interacting with RNAs derived from certain parts of the genome and not mm-hmm. others. Is that possible? Although I would wonder what that meant in the context of a virus host mismatch like this. Right? Is this is just a redundant system then, that acts the same way no matter which level you're at. Maybe, maybe. So they conclude Argonaut 1 interacts with uh, siRNAs to a lesser extent than 2 and 10. All right. Hmm. The next part is they ask um, what, which of these are binding uh, HC-PRO, this viral antagonist mm-hmm. protein. So that's the model is that um, the way this antagonist works is that it associates which, with the small RNAs that have been produced from the viral genome and prevents them from interacting with the Argonaut, right? And that would prevent silencing if the RNAs don't bind the Argonaut protein. So it silences itself to prevent being silenced. <clears throat> mm. Friend of my friend is my... Yes, uh, or my enemy of my enemies. <laughs> yeah. So they do the same approach. They How about the silence of the yams? If it were yams, that would be great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> too bad, too bad. Yeah, yes. We'll have to do a paper on yams one day. <laughs> Dixon, do these things just pop into your head? Well, it did just now, but unfortunately we're recording, so you could probably move this to the end if you'd no, like. But Alan often <laughs> things pop into his head. Yes. So they do the same <laughs> immunoprecipitation assay with HC Pro, right? They uh, have put an epitope tag, and they can pull it down, as Dixon says, which is horribly jargon, but I will, perpe- I will <laughs> perpetuate the jargon, and then sequence the small RNAs that are associated with it, Right. So they find that viral, uh, SI, they find host RNAs uh, bound to this as well, but they find viral RNAs enriched in these uh, HC pro immunoprecipitates. They were, now this is the interesting part. They find the SI RNAs enriched in immunoprecipitates from coline leaves, right, which are the ones off the stem. I'm looking at mm-hmm. your nice picture here, yeah. and inflorescence. So they inoculate lower down, and these SI RNAs can be found higher up in the plants. Mm-hmm. However, if you, um, that's for wild type virus. If you use the mutant virus, which no longer has uh, this antagonist protein, the viral RNAs from across the genome were depleted in the immuno, in the HC pro immunoprecipitates from the coline leaves only. Only from the coline leaves, not from other parts of the plant. So that's kind of, again, an extension of the argonaut kind of compartmentalization, if you will. Mm-hmm. So they conclude that the wild-type HC Pro, I didn't mention the mutant, actually. Uh, that was an oversight. Um, where is the mutant here? The HC mutant. Is I that, think it's, that's I Pro. Think it's the, yeah, it's the same mutation that AS9. they had in the virus to start with. Yeah, That's right. So the AS9, that's the result I just told you. Uh, the, the viral RNAs across the genome are depleted in this AS9 um, mutant pro- altered protein immunoprecipitate from uh, the systemically infected coline leaves. Only a few sequences are enriched. So in other words, the wild-type HC pro associates with the viral RNAs, and this mutation, this proline, I'm sorry, it's not a proline, it's, uh, it's called AS9. I think it's a single amino acid change, right? Wow. This disrupts the association. So when you do this sequencing of small RNAs, you see the effect of... Uh, pulling down with this altered protein, you get far fewer uh, siRNAs associating with the protein. 
So they, they believe this supports the idea that this HC Pro is binding uh, the siRNAs and, and blocking them from, from associating with Argonaut. So it would be like sequestering. Yeah. <clears throat> but what, what does that mean, though? I mean, just binding it and keeping it away? Is it really high affinity or mm. does it direct it to other pathways? And I also say suppression of HC, the activity of HC Pro is not tissue specific. And it also works for Argonaut 1, 2, and 10, and maybe the other Argonauts. So that's another question. Is it Argonaut specific, or does it work with all Argonauts? So, so with a Arabidopsis, you could actually engineer a plant to make HC Pro and then see what happens to the viral infections. It would probably get creamed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Should, if. Yeah. yeah, but right. that would be a GMO plant, wouldn't it? Though, <laughs> but that's stem well, I cell, think there's stem a lot of cell GMO. research. <laughs> a lot of GMO or Rapidospis. <laughs> there's a ton of. In fact, there is yeah. no non-GMO. <laughs> as far no, as I, I know. understand, but I, you know, there are people who would not sell them or buy them. Uh, no, Isn't no. Whole Foods not sell any GMO stuff? That's true. They don't. Yeah. They claim they don't, but how? At least they to know? their knowledge, yeah. How would yeah. they know? So basically, a couple of Argonauts are working as an antiviral defense. And um, the HC Pro prevents siRNA from loading in the in the Argonauts, yeah. and that's why this virus is able to infect the plant. So that's the conclusion, and very interesting approaches, very different from the viruses we talk about, as I said. So that's how you beat a turnip. <laughs> I have a couple comments. Yes. Um, the good news and the bad news. Yes. Uh, which do you want first? Uh, the bad news? Yeah. yeah bad news. Well, in the description of, of how they're going to do the um, immunoprecipitation, um, the first 12 lines of that, which is a paragraph and a couple lines in the next one, um, the whole paragraph could have been reordered to make it much more logical in terms of what they were trying to do. The ra This is the rationale for the next five pages of yeah, the paper yeah. and I had to spend about 20 minutes trying to sort it out and then then they they say they're going to do this immunoprecipitation and then they analyzed the uh the, they analyzed the small RNAs. They didn't say they sequenced them until the next sentence they start talking about yeah. only reads that match, da, da, da. I'm like, oh, <laughs> duh, I guess they're sequencing them. That's their analysis. Okay, so that's all for the bad news. That was a little disappointing to me. But the good news, well, one more bad news thing. They never <laughs> spell out what HC Pro is. Right. And it stands for helper component proteinase. Mm -hmm. And so that makes me wonder, why is a proteinase binding to these... SIRNAs. Yeah, I mean, how does yeah. how does that work? What what's that about? But okay. I had to go. I had to go look up HC Pro, and it's been around for a long time, yeah. and does all kinds of stuff. It is a multifunctional protein, and a, mm. my what I what I can gather out of this is that it does have a proteinase function, but that's uh, separate from what it's doing here. Right. That that's what it sounds like to me. Right. Um, what I do like is their model figure in figure seven. I because, agree. Um, first of all, it's color coded. So they have the leaf boxes are in green. And Ooh, up I didn't above get that. that, they have <laughs> the inflorescence boxes, and those are in gray. And, you know, the Arabidopsis flowers are, are white. So that's the way they could do that. And I just thought it was a really helpful figure and since uh steen had said you know see what you think of our graphical abstract <laughs> after i read the real abstract i went to that figure and studied that before i read the paper and right that helped good me a lot. idea i wish i had done that <laughs> so this is a good summary so in a in a wild type virus infected plant the inoculated leaves um the uh, hc pro binds up all the uh, sirnas that are produced so the virus is able to replicate and the same thing happens, and in that case, Argonaut 2, 10, 7, and 5 are important, but 2 is the most. And then in the inflorescences, the systemic spread, the, the siRNAs are also bound up um, by um, the HC Pro. Then if you infect with the virus with the altered HC Pro, uh, now the siRNAs are not able to bind, um, mm -hmm. are, are not bound by HC Pro because it's an altered protein, and now they're taken up by the Argonauts. And the most important is Argonaut 2, which has a big fat blocking line <laughs> on it. Mm -hmm. And then the, the line gets smaller and then dashed to show the lesser importance of the Argonauts. Uh, and in then the it, rosette leaves. It's right. And then in the, in the, in the uh, inflorescences, um, 
the Arg- Argonaut 2 is not as important there. Argonaut 10 and 1 are more important in the inflorescence as to the spread infection uh, from, the, from the inoculated leaves. So that's a cool summary of that. The right? figure looks like it was inspired graphically from a uh, Despicable Me cartoon, however, at least from where I sit. Despicable Me. <laughs> what does it look like? A, the minions? Uh, a minion? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> I'm surprised okay. you know about that, Dixon. Oh, I saw the movie. It was a lot of fun. Lots yep. of fun. Yep, yep, minions. All right. Anything else we should mention here? Oh, that's good. You know, one other thing that's pretty cool. I made a note here. What does it say? I can't read it. I made a little note box, and it's not working. Hmm. Hmm. Um, there is some evidence that these small RNAs are actually amplified in plants by RNA polymerases. Mm-hmm. Right? So plants have RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, and there's some evidence that they actually amplify these, which is pretty interesting. And um, I don't know if, if that has um, a, a counterpart in mammalian cells or not. Hmm. But that's cool. Yep. And the last thing they, they want to mention, they say the basis for sequestration of, of the small RNAs by HC Pro is, is not clear. And I think that's a really interesting point to figure out exactly what they do with this RNA when they bind it, right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> There's certainly RNA binding proteins in mammalian cells that would have a similar role if, in fact, yeah, RNA I were antiviral if we knew. Mm. So that's cool. All right, so that's our plant virus paper. Thank you, Steen. And I do want to do more of these because I, I learn a lot because I don't know very, very much about this field. And I was thinking about this, you know, when you there's really a segregation between plant and animal virologists, don't no, you think? No question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you go to meetings, they're often not at the same meeting. You know, at ASV, we do have quite a few plant virologists, right? And that's maybe one of the better meetings for mixing. But they tend to stay separate. They hang out with each other. And I don't know why. This shouldn't be, right? Because there are lots of principles that are similar between animal and plant viruses. And I I just know over the years that I've I've learned much more about animal viruses than plant viruses because of that. And I think Mm. it's unfortunate. And I also wonder if they have chips on their shoulders because of this, if they're worried that they don't get enough attention and so forth. And are those potato chips? Oh. Turnip chips. Turnip chips. Right. Sweet potato chips. Sweet Kale potato chips. chips. <laughs> We're going to get mail. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, speaking, yes, Kathy. You were no, say that's some, all. Uh, let's do some email. Kathy, can you take uh, that first one from Mauricio? Sure. Mauricio writes, Dear Vincent et al., I've been catching up with the latest TWIVs, and I have a follow-up about TWIV 321. I can understand that a handful of scientists might be against research that could potentially create a pandemic virus. Having a PhD or MD does not imply that a person can see beyond their fears or personal obsessions. However, I think that the way this moratorium on gain-of-function research was done indicates that NIH, the American Academy of Sciences, ASM, FASEB, and other scientific organizations have failed. Mm. I can't understand how this moratorium was imposed without any debate organized by any of these organizations. These professional associations should have a presence within the political circles, so whenever there are problems like these, politicians could have a more informed position. The question of whether a particular branch of research is dangerous or not should first be discussed by a widely arranged scientific panel, so the conclusions of such forum could be used as guidelines for the White House. This problem raises a very important question. What is the function of the National Academy of Sciences? Is this very selective group of scientists only good for having a high-profile journal? Is creating a very selective group of remarkable scientists the only goal of this organization? I think the fact that the White House did not ask the National Academy of Science for an opinion on this matter shows that it might be a worthless institution. (laughs) And when I read this, I hadn't really thought about what he was asking, and I couldn't figure out whether he was implying that the White House was the worthless (laughs) institution or the National Academy of Science. Um, Sorry for such a negative email, but I can't believe that this decision was taken before any discussion happened. As you mentioned in this TWIV episode, there are two completely opposite groups, and I think most likely the truth is in between. Hence, debate should take place. Science is not a place to impose a view or theory. However, I think that imposing moratoriums in science is an action from the medieval times, like the Holy Inquisition did for for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. In a more positive matter, I should say that your episode with John Coffin was just amazing. I think you should invite Jack, John... John Johnson from Scripps. In other words, Jack Johnson. (laughs) I am sure that your listeners would have a blast. He's just wonderful. One more thing. I've been trying to get to the episode where you explain why reverse genetics is the wrong term. (laughs) Could you elaborate on why this is the wrong term? Thanks for everything, Mauricio. 
So we can start first about the National Academy and Mm. what went into that uh, uh, moratorium decision. Yeah, so I wanted to speak up in defense of the National Academy because they do get bashed now and then as being sort of an old boys club of, uh, you know, who, you know, elect other famous people electing other famous people to their club. But the fact is that they are a uh, an important and viable institution. I just actually want to read this from their mission statement. The National Academy of Sciences is a private nonprofit society of distinguished scholars and established by an act of Congress signed by President Abraham Lincoln in 1863. The NAS is charged with providing independent, objective advice to the nation on matters related to science and technology. The National Research Council, created under the NAS Charter in 1916 by executive order of Woodrow Wilson, extended the scope of the NAS in its advisory role. The National Academy of Engineering and the Institute of Medicine were uh, founded under the NAS Charter in 1964 and 1970, respectively. Together, the NAS, NRC, NAE, and IOM enlist the age of the nation's most knowledgeable scientists, engineers, health professionals, and other experts who volunteer their time to produce reports that have led to some of the most significant and lasting improvements in health education and welfare of the world's citizens. The Academy's service to the government has become so essential that Congress and the White House have issued legislation and executive orders over the years to reaffirm its unique role. Now, of course, that was written by the National Academy, but I don't disagree with any of it. Um, they, it they, it they, is they, important to point out that that does not uh, disprove the boys club criticism which has some no, basis no they, they can they, they can coexist under the same umbrella okay yeah. <laughs> um, but they do uh, they do uh, perform an important function yes that having been said I asked the uh, only uh, National Academy member that's in arm's length of me Ken Burns whether or not the National Academy was uh, consulted when the White House uh, laid out its gain-of-function moratorium, and Ken said, not to his knowledge. If they were, he was unaware of it. Not that he would necessarily know everything that's going on, but I think the White House, you may have more into this, know more about this than I do, Vincent. You've got, uh, is Joe Handelsman get involved in this kind of stuff? I don't, I don't know. I have um, <clears throat> spoken with people who are close I haven't spoken with Joe, um, but I, I know there is, was concern and, and is concern about Fushie Kawaoka experiments. So I would not be surprised if uh, she were involved in this. Um, no one is willing. I have some contacts who are pretty close to this, and no one is willing to say who <laughs> initiated it. It's not clear. It's just that it came from the White House. And... Um, I, I mean, I agree with Mauricio. I don't see why we had to have a moratorium. Why couldn't we have a debate? Right. Right. I just, now, there, now, there was call for a debate and all this stuff about how we're going to do another yeah. Asilomar and that kind of – but that – has anything happened to that? Or yeah, that there's been kind of, a couple of meetings. So the idea was to have a moratorium, and then during the year they would have various debates. So there have been a couple of NAS-sponsored meetings. Um, also, the um, NSABB has had – there was one NAS meeting having to do with – Gain of function. There were, I think, at least two NSABB sponsored meetings, uh, and you know, Paul Dupre was at was at one of them. That's right. Um, and the last I heard is that they're extending the moratorium, you know, for more time than a year. And I just don't understand this at all. I don't know why we cannot just discuss it when pe- and let people, you know, the research that was funded in Kawaoka, Fushie, and other laboratories is not being done. And I don't see why we can't do that. When a doctor taps your taps you right under the knee with a little rubber hammer, why don't you think about it before you kick? <laughs> a knee jerk, yes. So th- this is what happened here, um, and the the hype was so loud and so well publicized that um, there wasn't this discussion because these organizations, which are worthwhile organizations that normally lobby on behalf of science and and stand up for rationality, um, they were not given that opportunity at all. Mm-hmm. What happened was, as the Fushie and Kawaoka papers were coming out, the NSABB 
went ape about it, and the poorly written um, Fouchier paper draft uh, in particular was, I think, a big cause of this. Um, and it triggered this this public hand wringing about, oh my God, these scientists are doing these dangerous experiments, which touched on a whole set of tropes that we have dating back to at least the Manhattan Project and before. Um, that uh, I mean, this is this is a movie plot, right? And it just trotted out this whole script that things were awful, things were going to happen that were cooked up secretly in laboratories. Um, the public went ape, and there was this very loud call for why don't you politicians stop this? And so they did. It was yes, of course, this was handed down from the White House. The White House didn't really have a lot of choice in the matter. Because if they had not intervened and said, okay, we're going to do something to pause this research, then it would have been, uh, you know, the pitchforks and torches would have been outside their gate. Mm. So, no, the National Academy of Sciences was not asked for an opinion because this was not a scientific question. This was a political and public relations question, and the only way to to tone it down was... Um, a, pretty much the course of action that was taken, which was, okay, we're going to have a moratorium on this. Um, and unfortunately, that has now become the new normal. Um, now, of course, these organizations are getting involved. I don't know that the National Academy of Sciences can simply um, come out and stake a claim on some position. I think they actually have to go through their usual deliberative process, which is usually mm-hmm. something that is commissioned. Um, I think there's a process for them to initiate that on their own, but it's not fast. Um, and that's generally the case with rational thinking. It's uh, You get the right answer, but you don't get it immediately. <laughs> um, the AAAS, the ASM, I think, did come out with, to some extent, some statement about this. Um, they all those organizations have called for discussion of this. Um, there have been discussions of this, so that is ongoing. But as far as uh, the the initial moratorium, that was not something that was given an opportunity to be dis- to be discussed. As far as I know, at the moment, what's happening is they that a couple of firms have been contracted to do uh, risk benefit assessments. Yes. Which are, I think are going to be a joke. Yes. Right? Science, a risk benefit assessment. Anyway, right. that, then they're going to be announced and then they'll make a final decision. So we'll see what's happening there. Um, reverse genetics. I'd like to start by describing what forward genetics is. <laughs> Do we have to? Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought it was all just genetics. Well, forward okay. genetics. In, in the terminology, if you're going to use forward and reverse, forward genetics is determining the genetic basis responsible for a phenotype, a phenotype being a trait. Why is the flower red? Why is the tree tall? Why does the animal have a black tail? That, those things are all phenotypes. Um, and there can also be molecular phenotypes, of course. So you're trying to figure out the phenotype um, and from the, start, starting with the mutant phenotype uh, and then go back to the gene. Okay, so in that context, reverse genetics is possible because of recombinant DNA technology. You start with a protein or DNA for which you don't maybe even know any kind of function, and you mutate it, and then you look and see what kind of uh, phenotype you get, what kind of trait you get when you've made that mutation. So that's forward and reverse genetics. When... RNA virologists have taken it up for describing how they make their molecular clones of their viruses. It is confusing because there are already these definitions for reverse genetics that I've just described. And so, um, as uh, Paul Dupree said in, uh, in a blog post, uh, We also do a lot of reverse genetics, which simply means stitching together molecular clones from clinical isolates, making the viruses, and growing them in cells. And so my simple uh, way of putting it is that whenever you talk about reverse genetics for viruses or a reverse genetic system, what you really can do is just replace that by 
molecular clone of the virus. And having a molecular clone of your negative strand RNA virus, you can now manipulate it, make mutations, put those uh, manipulated nucleic acids back into cells or animals or plants and figure out what those genes are doing. Yeah, I, I just want to say that we, David Baltimore and I made an infectious clone of poliovirus <laughs> in 1981, and it was many years before it was done with any other virus, and we called them infectious clones that enable you to do genetics with RNA viruses. And we didn't call it reverse genetics because we felt it was just genetics. But then when the flu people made their infectious clones, they introduced the term and then ev everything went to hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and while you call it infectious clone, um, I guess I'm a little more conservative when I say a molecular clone because you might struggle and struggle and struggle and it, it might not be infectious yeah. or in the per first system that you look at or something yeah. like that. I just think it's genetics. You know, you make... Everything starts, most uh, phenotypes start with a mutation, whether you've selected in a, in a, by putting a drug or something in a virus or you've introduced a mutation. It's just genetic analysis, so I, I don't see why we need to distinguish it, and that's why I don't like it. But obviously it's there to stay because, you know, usage just gets ingrained and that's it. Yeah, I don't well, think you're going to win this one. No, I'm not fighting no. it, but I do express my opinion. I don't express proteins, and I don't do reverse <laughs> genetics. <laughs> so, so Vincent and I dislike the term reverse genetics for two different reasons. Right. I dislike it because there's already an explanation for what we think reverse yeah. genetics is. But I also agree with Vincent that I think that we should just be talking about molecular clones of the viruses, and it's... Yeah not reverse genetics. Dixon, this is an email about uh, James Joyce. Can you read yeah, that? I'll try, because James Joyce is very difficult <laughs> to read. I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I did read it, but I probably didn't understand what I read, but that doesn't mean that I have... Uh, You're not alone in this I'm not, I'm not yeah, less of I'm a right person there with because you. of that. <laughs> That's right. So Anthony writes, uh, yeah. for the TWIV episode of June 14th, before this year's Bloomsday... That's June 16th. Perhaps it might be interesting to mention literature's most important virus, the FMD picornavirus. Joyce shows us that nonsense in newspapers about viruses is nothing new. <laughs> Thank you for TWIV. That inoculation against ignorance and disinformation. <laughs> so then he does a quote from Ulysses by James Joyce, the very famous Irish author. And I pick it up in the middle of the text. <laughs> Quote, I have put the matter into a nutshell, Mr. Deasy said. It's about the foot and mouth disease. Just look through it. There can be no two opinions on the matter. May I trespass on your valuable space? That doctrine of laissez-faire, which so often in our history... Our cattle trade, the way of all our old industries, Liverpool ring, which jockeyed the Galway harbor scheme, European conflagration, grain supplies through the narrow waters of the channel, the pluperfect imperturbability of the Department of Agriculture, pardoned a classical allusion, Cassandra, by a woman was no better than she should be, to come to the point at issue. I don't mince words, do I? Mr. Deasy asked as Stephen, Stephen read on. Foot and mouth disease, known as Coke's preparation, serum and virus, percentage of salted horses, rinderpest, emperor's horses at Merstkeg, lower Austria, veterinary surgeons, Mr. Henry Blackwood Price Courteous, offer a fair trial. Dictates of common sense. All important question. In every sense of the word, take the bull by the horns, thanking you for the hospitality of your columns. I want that to be printed and read, Mr. Deasy said. Will you see, at the next outbreak, they will put an embargo on Irish cattle, and it can be cured. It is cured. My cousin, Blackwood Price, writes to me, it is regularly treated and cured in Austria by cattle doctors there. They offer to come over here. I'm trying to work up influence with the department. Now I'm going to try publicity. I'm surrounded by difficulties, by intrigues, by 
backstairs influence by end of quote this NPR story was about to you. <laughs> Not bad, Dixon. Very oh, good. Yeah. Can yeah. someone explain it? No. Not it's really. Got, it's got FMBV in it. That's yes. all I can tell you. Uh, Percentage really. of salted horses. That I, was the one that was really weird. You know, yeah. This is all stream of consciousness, and basically that's the story of my life. So <laughs> what can I say? It's easy to read because that's just what pops into my head every now and then anyway. Bloomsday, by the way, I didn't know this, is a cel- as a commemoration and celebration of the life of Irish writer James Joyce. Correct. During oh, yeah. which the events of his novel U- Ulysses are relived. That's right. Uh, and it's uh, June 16th. Wasn't last year a remarkable year for that? Didn't they have a big celebration in Ireland Maybe. because of it? Yeah. I think it was a nationwide holiday. Yeah. Nobody remembers what happened because, like, of course. Don't be in Dublin on June 16th. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Mm. Next one and is, this is this is a right. good reason to never read Ulysses. <laughs> oh, in no. My book. It's an interesting book. The <laughs> Agonbite of Inwit. The Agonbite of Inwit. You'll have to look that one up, but maybe that's what we should name this uh, story, The Agonbite of Inwit. Because that, that, that occurs again and again throughout this um, narrative. And you can look it up, and it's got a complicated meaning. All right. Uh, next was from Sean. Hello, fabulous TWIV team. Greetings and salutations from UCLA. I found this cool article on Facebook and was wondering what you all thought about it. You sent a link to an article. <clears throat> well, you have to always worry about Facebook, but it's, it's uh, <laughs> neuroscience news. Researchers find missing link between brain and immune system. Mm. In a stunning discovery that overturns decades of <laughs> textbook teaching, researchers at the University of Virginia School of Medicine have determined that the brain is directly connected to the immune system by vessels previously thought not to exist. That such vessels could have escaped detection when the lymphatic system has been so thoroughly mapped is surprising. All right, so basically there are lymph connections between uh, the brain and the immune system. And this is actually not new. It's been known before. In fact, there's a guy out in Long Island who does this. He has shown connections between the spleen and the brain via the lymphatics and this is pretty cool for sure um but it's not new is this got well, it, got him, no, paper, this, this it is, got him a paper in nature this is this uh, is new enough that yeah the fact no, that the there's a whole there's a whole lymphatic system but that we know is, this we know this for I other know, organs but uh, there was never thought to be one for the brain if you right. there's a picture that i don't i can't pull up right at the moment that i saw yes, earlier at the today the bottom of this the, there's a picture at the bottom of the article that uh, vincent was just reading from ah okay that, where that shows where we thought the lymph system went to before and it pretty much yeah. stops about the ear and now we know <laughs> that it's in the brain and that yeah. does have a lot of mm. consequences for neuroinflammation neurodegenerative diseases and sure. so forth i heard, I heard that guy give a talk here last year and he he basically showed lymph connections between the brain and the spleen, okay? So I don't doubt that this is nice, but the idea that there are connections of these sorts I don't think is really new. Yeah, but the well, brain this is, the brain yeah, this, is this an is immunologically uh, silent organ. No. Privileged. It, well, it had been thought it's to be basically, that, but, it, but even chinks in that wall had been broken yeah, for some time now. Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, for, for several years... Um, at the New York Academy of Sciences, I was sort of their default writer for their neuroimmunology group. <laughs> and the first time they sent me an assignment for this, I said, wait, neuroimmunology, is that right. a thing? Right. And, and of course it was, um, yeah. 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 It, because over the past couple of decades, we've found more and more and more stuff going on immunologically with the brain, and it became clearer and clearer that there's a, a whole lot of traffic going on between these two systems. So it's really... Mm-hmm. This is new, as I say. They got a Nature paper out of it. It's it's interesting, and they mapped this lymphatic system, so it's really there. Um, but yes, if you were following this, you um, you know certainly if you work on a neurotropic virus, you were already right. well aware that <clears throat> we were kind of headed in this direction already. Mm-hmm. That this this discovery was was in the offing. Mm. Well, I got I did listen to this seminar, and the guy talked about this very thing. He's not on this paper, but. Um, I thought it was pretty mm. neat. Mm. Spleen brain, and he showed how certain brain stimuli could lead to uh, immune reactions in the spleen via this connection. So that's why I was not mm. surprised mm. at this. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's the wrong guy. 
So uh, some of us think it's great, Sean, and others <laughs> think it's so hum. Okay. But well, in pro- fact, Andrea wrote in with the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, Sean, with a link uh, to the Nature paper, the next one. Oh, that's right. A completely new part of the immune system. I can't wait to see how such an exciting discovery will affect both science and medicine. Yes. Well, we'll see. We'll cover the articles. Now, Sean is um, in L.A. where it's beautifully sunny. <laughs> right. Next winter, please FedEx some snow to us. Really? Alan and Vincent, it was lovely meeting you at ASM last year. Okay. Okay. That was in Boston, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. And Andrea um, thanks us for the podcast. I listen to it all the time while I work in my retail job. Cool. I'm 21, and you all help motivate my dream to save and get back into school as fast as possible to major in microbiology. Wow. Maybe someday specialize in virology. I can dream. Can't I? Of course. Now, of course. Andrea is from Naples, Florida. Nice. Oh. Lovely town. Wow. I love Naples. I do, too. 72. She, I can't help but send in this article as I read it at 2.30 in the morning. I wasn't kidding about not being able to wait. So she wrote us the email at 2.30. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Alan, can you take the next one? Yes, which is from Dakota, um, spelled with a cool. D instead of a T for the for a second consonant there. Um, hello, Vincent and cohorts. I am an undergraduate biology student recently turned on to your podcast by my cell bio professor after expressing interest in the field. I have spent much of my free time early into the summer listening to TWIV and with each episode find myself wishing more and more than that the break would hurry up and end so I can get back into the classroom and labs. <laughs> I'm sitting, and, and also so you can listen to less TWIV, right? Um, <laughs> I'm sitting in a library in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh. The sights and sounds of Bronson Park just across the street are bursting with life as people enjoy the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts Fair. It is an ideal June day. Clear blue skies, 18 degrees C, 13 kilometer per hour wind, 51% humidity, and no notable seismic activity in the last month. Hmm. We did have an earthquake uh, in early May. Mm -hmm. Really? To a a little item on the Michigan earthquake. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, after that not-so-brief introduction, I have a question. I just listened to TWIV 333 and really enjoyed the discussion with Megan, Meredith, Bobak, and Ben from Vanderbilt University. I was wondering if there are any other episodes that you interview PhD students. Currently, I'm in a transfer program from a community college to a four-year university, and while I feel that I'm being well-prepared to finish my undergrad, there isn't much information on what to expect or prepare for after that. Mm-hmm. Any relevant links would also be appreciated. Mm-hmm. Uh, expect or prepare for unemployment after that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, that uh, was an ad lib. <laughs> yes. Um, A Joycean comment. <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah. So, actually, Vincent has included a number of... Um, of links here for shows where we had students on, but not really interviews. You know, they right. just talked about science. But I think it's a good idea to get do a yeah. show with students. That's that would mm-hmm. be fun. Yep. Yeah, something best done at ASV. But uh, that's what I, it's exactly what I was thinking. This year we're booked, but maybe in a subsequent year we could get some PhD students on it on Twib yeah, on yeah, ASV. That would be fun. All right, the last one, Rich. Mary writes, "Hi guys, I love your shows." I'm an MPH student in environmental systems and human health, and I've been enjoying your TWIP, TWIV, and TWIM shows immensely. I recently discovered the podcast, and I'm still making my way through all the episodes. I do have a question I was hoping you could answer for me. I heard a story in May about a doctor who'd been infected with Ebola, and several months after the virus had been cleared from his bloodstream, they found it still living in his eye. My question is, how was this virus able to survive in the eye without being detected in the bloodstream. Does this have implications about latent Ebola infections that could potentially be reactivated? Any information you can provide would be appreciated. Thank you so much. Keep up the great uh, work. Cheers, Mary. And uh, yeah, we did an episode on, or at least we discussed this particular issue about this uh, uh, patient who wound up with Ebola in his eye. And my Mm. my assumption is that it was established there during the time that he was viremic, that is, had virus in his bloodstream, but it being an immune privilege site and probably some other weirdness associated with it, it persisted after the virus was cleared from the rest of his system. And whether or not that's going to have uh, issues down the road, we also discussed, uh, I think it was last week. Just last week. Wasn't it? Yes. Was it that we discussed a, a paper uh, looking at the spectrum of um 
sequelae from uh, right. Ebola infections uh, in a previous outbreak some time ago. And the answer is there are numerous sequelae, uh, and how these are going to work out in the long run is uh, we don't really know, but there are issues. And we're going to yep. find out a lot about this in the near future, I think. Yeah, this was never a huge issue because there were never very many survivors of an epi epidemic uh, or any epidemic that got all that big, and now we've got thousands of people. So, right. so yeah, it's TWIV 336, uh, brought to you by the letters <laughs> H, N, P, and I. Yes. Wonderful. Spelled E-Y-E. -E. And should we, um, speaking of Ebola, um, do we need a little uh, brief situation report? It's not over yet. Sit rep. Sit rep. Sit rep. Get there fastest. So, yes, I just got to the WHO <laughs> um, summary here. As of June 24th, there were 20 confirmed cases of Ebola virus disease uh, reported in the previous week compared with 24 the previous week. Um, Which countries are we talking about? We're talking about, um, where is it still? persisting. It's like uh, tw uh, 12 in Guinea and 8 in Sierra Leone. It's, yeah, it's only right. in Guinea Liberia's, and Sierra Leone. Right now. Liberia is clean. Liberia is done. Um, and it is, it's just kind of bumping along. It's, um, you know, it was, it came down and then it's just been sort of sticking around the single digits to just barely double digits for weeks. Yeah, here's some kind of bad news. Uh, cases have been reported from the same four prefectures in Guinea for the past three weeks, but yeah. the area of active transmission within them has changed and in several instances has expanded. It's that last yeah. little bit. Uh, yeah, it's interesting, you know, because a couple of years ago, uh, 20 cases of Ebola somewhere in Africa would have been front page news all over the place. And yeah. now it's completely out of the news. Yeah. In fact, yeah, we we had even stopped doing the sit reps for a couple yep. of weeks there, but right. this is still going on and it's still um it just very very itself. hard to get it to get the, those last yep. few. Well, speaking of outbreaks, uh, MERS in South Korea. Yes. Just a new case uh on the 26th, that's today. A new one new case and two deaths brings to 181. Uh, total cases in South Korea, and 31 dead. Now, that one does seem to be winding down, but we'll see. Right. Okay, let's do some picks. All okay. right. <laughs> <laughs> sure thing. <laughs> really, you think? <laughs> yeah, we do think. Alan, what do you have? I have a, uh, a video. It's YouTube, so it'll automatically play. Um but this is a, a nifty, nifty technique that I just came across for a story I'm working on. Um, in neuroscience, one of the a very old techniques that's been going on for decades is, uh, is electrophysiology measurements. And you traditionally, you would do this by sectioning a, a mouse brain or a rat brain. You take the section and you'd plug electrodes into um, a neuron and you'd measure the current or voltage in it. And then that has evolved into doing that in vivo where a gifted surgical manipulator uh, manages to get a thin electrode wire into the animal's brain to target a particular area, um, and then they you can probe an individual neuron inside the living brain, and that's been done for a number of years. Um, the trick, though, is um, you you need to get the wire to the right place inside the brain, and of course you can't generally see very well where you're putting it. Um, and this requires a great deal of finesse because you're dealing with a very generally small animal brain that you're trying to insert this thing into, and only a few people can manage to pull this off. So this is a technique that um, automates that process um, hmm. and, and allows you to insert the electrode um, with a, a, you use a robot that inserts the, the electrode and detects where it is in the brain based on its own readings and then when it gets to the right spot um, you start reading data from that particular neuron and it's just I, I just found this really really cool <laughs> yeah, it is very I'm looking amazing. at the video now uh, and the animations on the video are quite yeah, good it's, too. Good. it's, it's very good. professionally yeah. done Rich Condit what do you have uh, a few weeks or months ago 
we had as a pick this book, The Martian. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been picked up as a movie that's going to star uh, Matt Damon. And the official trailer is out, and I just have to <laughs> pick it because it's awesome. <laughs> this looks this looks really good. Yeah, it does look great. It's going to be a fun movie. <laughs> yes, it's going to be a fun movie. Well, this may be a record for picks. The Martian may get three picks. Okay, the book, the trailer, and the movie. And the movie, <laughs> but not the planet. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was great. Have you read it, uh, Dixon? No, I have not. You should. Maybe. You should try reading. Nah. No. I just did. I mean, I told you I read Ulysses. Read Ulysses. All right. Kathy, what do you have? Well, in a continuing theme, um, there was an uh, article, a blog, actually, a Scientific American blog, and the woman, uh, the title of it is, Lego adds more women in science to its lineup. And the blog post is a little bit kind of all over the place. I'm not sure what her overall theme is, but she does talk about um, some new Legos, a uh, spaceport set, uh, a deep sea explorer set. And then she kind of uh, complains about some of these other sets that uh, have some more stereotypic women in them. Um, but then at the end, she mm. also points out uh, in the Lego ideas realm, uh, where fans uh, propose a Lego set and they need to get 10,000 votes to even move forward to be considered by Lego. Uh, there's one uh, for the Big Bang Theory. There's one for Lovelace and Babbage. Uh, oh, so the Big Bang Theory uh, includes uh, uh, the neuroscientist... Uh, Amy and Bernadette, the microbiologist. Uh, then Lovelace and Babbage, who built the first computer, so this is from the 1800s, um, so it features Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage. There's a research geology one, and then there's one that's the Scientists in History collection. And so it's got Tesla and Marie Curie, uh, uh, physicist Lisa Meitner, and then not pictured in the in the blog post, uh, evidently Rosalind Franklin is part of this set as well. Mm. And so if you just go to this blog post, then there's a link uh, for voting for each of these. And if you've ever done a vote for these Lego things, they never send you any spam email or anything like that. You just register so that you can vote. And it's worth uh, voting for one or more of these uh, science mini Lego sets. Cool. I think. Cool. Could you explain Tesla in that group for me, Kathy? Um, well, it's just a scientist in history collection. It's not a women in science thing, oh, okay. necessarily. I, I thought for a moment so, there I was uh, looking at a transgender... Uh, no, 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 no. It's just, <laughs> no. just, I think there's... Okay. Yeah. It's, so, I'm, I'm not familiar with Lisa Meitner. I plead ignorance here. Sorry. Um, but, so that means that three out of the four are women, but uh, okay. no, Tesla's I, I in just, there, too. Yep. Yeah. Right. Incidentally, um, for many, in, in many cases, if you want to do this yourself, um, the only gendered thing about the majority of Lego figures is the head. Right. <laughs> so you can actually make a female, you know, whatever you want, just by swapping one of the female heads in and, huh. and hair styles in on top of whatever it is that you wanted to be female. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. However, my uh, mini Lego scientist, who and she was the first one, she's mentioned in this blog post, um, she has some figure attributes in her body that would not work right. Okay. with right. a male head. Right. Do you, Legos have figures, really? Like painted on, you mean? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I'm picking her up and looking at her closely, yeah. And she has a waist and more. Dixon, yes. can you hand me my uh, scientist Lego thingy? can hand you your scientist. Like <laughs> I want to just see this. But, yeah, it's probably just going to be a straight chest yeah, the, hips the, thing for the males. Yeah, I see. <laughs> well, but what I'm say, saying uh, is you could take any of the male figures, you could pop a female head onto it, and it'll look like... Um, yeah. your, your picture on your Skype uh, has it there, but it's not very big. I can't see it. Yeah. I'll take your uh, word for it. Dixon, what do you have Well, for I've got two related picks. They match with each other. The first is a, um, a release by NASA of, I think it's about four months worth of Landsat uh, 8 data uh, with hourly uh, picks. And it's got to be more than Landsat 8. It's got to be all the Landsats, basically. And they've patched it all together to give you a movie of what the Earth looks like 
with regards to rainfall and snowfall over, I guess it's a, around a four-month period. It's absolutely stunning and remarkable. It's it's a video that's just uh, mind-blowing. I, I watched it again and again. The related pic is an explanation by the scientists who generated these figures explaining the meaning of some of the storms that they show you in the snow deposits and the glaciation and stuff like this. It's really quite, it's earth science basically, but if we could get a yearly picture of the earth with regards to weather and the annual rainfalls in various areas, it may help to flesh out some of the epidemiology for some of the diseases that are actually dependent upon these conditions for their spread. Yeah. So I thought of a connection there right away. I see, Kathy. Yeah. I mean, it's very subtle. <laughs> yeah. You just need one stroke with a pencil, and that's all you need, right? Oh, there's also well, it's got, it's some got curves. got a little crimp at the waist it's got there, a crimp, too. Okay. Yeah. I like Sorry, it. Dixon. Really cool. and no, no worries. No worries. I, I had this in. Uh, I had this uh, cool. nice uh, weather thing in my queue as well. I had seen it before. It's really very, oh, cool. very cool. Isn't it neat? I mean, yeah. nice. it's, it, I never yeah, get tired of looking I at did, the Earth performing. I, I must agree. This is a good pick. Yeah, <laughs> it was good. You should look at it. It's quite amazing the the time lapse of the world. Yeah, you see all these little twirling but storms. The other it's thing, cool. the other pick that goes with it blew my mind with regards to how big the screen was that these people were standing next to and the resolution of it <laughs> to explain step by step what this storm meant and what that storm meant. Do you want meant. one of those screens, Dixon? I do. I want a room full of it. It would be fantastic. Yeah. For instance, there was a, a hurricane that went off the coast of the United States uh, and didn't actually touch land in the U.S. and said, well, you know, so who cares? It doesn't hurt anybody. It made it all the way over to England and caused flooding uh, on the leeward side of uh, of that uh, island into Europe. Yep. Leeward, Dixon. Yeah, I know. What, what does that mean? That means wherever the wind was blowing. Come on, you're a sailor. You can explain this. The downwind <laughs> side. It's on the opposite side of the wind side. So right. if you have an island. The rail that's underwater. As the yeah. storm <laughs> hits the island, that's the, sto- that's the windward side. The rail that's underwater? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, l- the leeward side of the boat is the low. <laughs> oh, That's the low the side. side. Okay, that I got. There's more the hell with the island. <laughs> yeah. I, I just wanted you to explain it, Dixon. Yeah, actually, knew. you want me to struggle through all of these. That's fine. I don't Thanks. mind. You're embarrassing I don't me mind. again. That's, uh, that's quite right. You think I like to do that? <laughs> I do, actually. <laughs> Now, I have a pic, Dex, and I have a photography. I saw pic. it. I saw it. It's fantastic. This is awesome. It's fantastic. Yeah, I, I like this site. I, I good check stuff. it out now and then. Really and good they, stuff. They had uh, 27 macro photography of bugs. and Yeah, they're great. They're great. The one I love is the one of these ants holding this <laughs> bloody... That's exactly the one I was looking at. <laughs> Holy cow. That's it's right. Holding and you up... know, it's my favorite, too. And my brother Jeff and I just went to the Chinese <laughs> acrobat circus uh <laughs> Yes. thing <laughs> Sunday yes. night and or, well it's not circus but I mean it, it was acrobats and the sure. very first thing they did they had these big rings with their bodies inside of them just like this oh, I, it was so cool oh, fun. these are pretty cool gorgeous. they're great so I thought you would like that Dixon I love it okay yeah. uh, we do have a listener pick May writes hi Vincent and Twiv Masters I just finished listening to audiobook P53, The Gene That Cracked the Cancer Code by Sue Armstrong. She is, Sue is a science writer, same line of work as Alan Dove. Yep. Did you, is that what you do, Alan? I, I have been known to do that, <laughs> yes. The book is entertaining and an easy read with very little science jargon, but plenty of stories and vivid characters. It traced the history of P53 from its discovery as a band of P53 kilodaltons with no known function to P53 based gene therapy approved in China. The story of P53 has many twists and turns. It's involved in DNA damage repair. As such, it's described as guardian of the genome, but in the beginning, people thought it was an oncogene. There were papers published implicating P53 as an oncogene, and only one guy could not get the same result. I can't remember his name. You will have to read the book. That's the problem with the audiobook. It's hard to flip back to get the details. Turns out, only this guy had wild type P53, while the others did their experiments with, <clears throat> she says, altered P- mutant P53. <laughs> but it should be altered. <laughs> this somehow reminded me of the XMRV story. Then Vogelstein found mutant P53 in colorectal cancer patients and declared P53 as a tumor suppressor gene. P53 
mutation was found in smokers, and this finding helped to bring down the tobacco industry. What I enjoyed most are the stories about how discoveries were made. As the author quotes Isaac Asimov, the most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discoveries, is not Eureka, but that's funny. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's a nice beach read. I highly recommend it. Cool. You know, Twiv is a good beach listen. <laughs> yes. And by the way, I never knew that the tobacco industry had been brought down. I think it has still, not. Still functional. Still no, in fact, there's a there's a, one branch of it is uh, local to me, right in the Connecticut Valley. This is apparently the place where the special tobacco that's used to wrap cigars is grown. Really? Right. The the leaf wrappers for cigars. So there, when I moved here, um, I, I was surprised to go driving down the road and I saw tobacco barns, which having grown up in Maryland, of course, yeah. I recognized. All I thought, tobacco barns? Were oh, yeah, Connecticut. Connecticut? Huge, huge. And apparently it's a big thing here. Oh, yeah. Hmm. The other ironic statement here is the fact that China is using P53 as a, a cancer treatment and they're one of the largest consumers of cigarettes. Yes. I believe that's the adenovirus that uh, propagates preferentially in P53 deficient tumors, right? Interesting. That's what they're talking about. That's licensed there in China. Right. Um, Onyx 015. Yep. DL-1520 made by Doug Barker (laughs) and Arnie Burke. (laughs) Yes. They call... uh, they call it Oncorine there, I think. I'm just looking at it here. I wrote a post recently on that. Yes, um, adenovirus Oncorine for head and neck tumors. And that is licensed in China. Yeah, it's pretty cool. You can go to the website, sunwaybio.com.cn, and you can read all about it. All right, that will do it for... Twiv343. You can find this and all the previous ones at twiv.tv also on iTunes, or you can get it on your mobile device, your phone, or your tablet, you know, Android or iOS. The podcatchers for both of them, and you can subscribe. Check it out. And if you have questions or comments, please send them to twiv at twiv.tv. Mm-hmm. Dixon de Pommier is at Mm, verticalfarm.com that's where he's the most famous that's, well where, where would you say you're the most famous Dixon trichinella.org was my original home and I would like everyone to know that I'm still there are you there I am excellent thank you Dixon yeah. you're welcome uh, by the way next week I'm going to bring in Ulysses and read the whole thing to you guys we're not, we're not going <laughs> to uh, I just thought yourself. I'd put that in there <laughs> we're not going to be here Dixon <laughs> well that's why I probably said you that you can too. just sit here I can turn on the recorder and you can record it uh, you don't have enough Space for that. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. You like plant viruses? I do. You should do one now and then, right? Mm-hmm. You bet. Can pull more plant virologists into the fold and expose the listenership to this very interesting area of virology. It's cool stuff. Yeah. Rob inoculation. That's a great name. You know, when I first saw it, I said, what the hell is this? <laughs> Rubino, Rub, what? <laughs> <laughs> Rich Condit is at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Always a good time. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com, also on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another twiv is viral. Mm-hmm.